Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about the basics of finding the domain and range of a function. So I want to just start out by saying that the examples that we're going to do today are going to be very, very basic. And as you get into Algebra 2 and the College Algebra, we'll look at methods for determining the domain and the range for more complicated functions. But for now, let's just stick with the basics. This is Algebra 1. Let's take a little time and just understand the basics. So the domain of a function, okay, the domain of a function is the set of all numbers that can be plugged in for x in a function. So it's basically the set of all permissible values. What can x take on? Okay. So then similarly, the range of a function is the set of all possible values that y can take on. Okay. And as we do some examples, you're going to see what this really means. So we want to think of a function as plugging in for x. This is our input. Okay, this is our input. And receiving a y value or an output. Now this y is going to change starting in the next lesson. We're going to start referring to it as f of x. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. It's just a notational change. It really is the same thing. Okay, so let's focus on how to find the domain and range for each function. And again, the examples we're going to look at are going to be really, really simple. And I know a lot of you watching this video will have homework on these complex functions, and you'll want to know how do I find the domain and range of these. And that's something we're going to address in later algebra classes. The best thing I can tell you to do for right now is if you have trouble finding your domain in the range, graph it. Take your TI-83 out or your TI-84 or whatever you have and graph your function. Go ahead and look at the graph, and that's going to help you to determine what the domain and the range is. Okay, so with something simple like y equals negative 4x plus 7, what can we plug in for x here? What would the domain be? Domain. Remember, that's the set of permissible x values. Well, I know this is just a line, right? This is y equals mx plus b, right? This is a slope of negative 4 and a y-intercept of 0, comma 7. Do I have any restrictions on what I can plug in for x here? Well, no, I don't. So the domain would be the set of all real numbers. So if I write this in integral notation, it would be from negative infinity out to infinity. I can plug anything I wanted for x here. So again, my domain is a set of all real numbers. Now, similarly, for my range, Here I can plug anything in for x, and my output, my y, can be anything as well. That would be the set of all real numbers. So my range, again, is a set of all real numbers. So looking at the graph for this function, this y equals negative 4x plus 7, we can see our domain is the set of all real numbers. We can see our range is a set of all real numbers because this line extends indefinitely in both directions. Okay, so it's easy to see that. Again, the domain and the range for this function, y equals negative 4x plus 7, is all real numbers. So let's look at something a little bit more challenging. Okay, let's say you have something like y equals 3x squared. What would the domain be in this case? Okay, we're going to look at the graph in a minute, but for right now, what would y equals 3x squared, what would the domain be? Well, is there a restriction on what I can square? I'm plugging something in for x and then I'm squaring it. Any restriction on that? Well, no, there's not. I can square a negative number, I can square a positive number, I can square a fraction, I can square whatever I want. Okay, it doesn't matter. So the domain would be, again, the set of all real numbers. But for the range, it's a little bit more challenging because we have to think about the result of squaring a number. When we square a number, we know that the result is always going to be non-negative. Okay, non-negative. So let's say I square the number negative 1. Well, negative 1 squared would be 1, and then 1 times 3 would be 3. So I know my result here is never going to be negative. In fact, the lowest it can be is 0. Because if I plug a 0 in for x, okay, if I plug a 0 in there for x, 
I'd have 0 squared, and then 0 times 3 would be 0. Well, 0 is not a negative number. It's not a positive number or a negative number. It's a, a number that is special, right? Not negative or positive. So the range here would be the set of non-negative real numbers, okay? It can't be negative, again, because x is being squared, and if you square something that's negative, it becomes positive. So the lowest value that this can take on is 0. So your range would be from 0 to infinity. And I think we can see that if we look at the graph. Okay, we look at the graph here for this function. And you can see that right here is your lowest value for the function. Right, That occurs at 0, 0. Right, You plug a 0 in for x. Right, right there, and you get a 0 for y. 0 squared is 0, 0 times 3 is 0. So 0 comma 0 is the lowest point on this function, right, when you see it right there. So this is how graphing really helps you to visually inspect and see, well, what is my domain and what is my range, okay? Now I can tell that the way this thing is going, I can have any value for y or for my range that is greater than 0. And then, of course, for x, I can put any value going to the left, any negative value in I want, and any positive value in that I want. So again, the domain is going to be the set of all real numbers, and the range will be the set of all non-negative real numbers, so the numbers from 0 to infinity. Okay, so the last one I want to look at is something that a lot of students have trouble with. It's y equals 1 over x. And if you're in Algebra 1 and you're watching this video, and you're kind of limited in what you've done with domain and range, don't expect to get this one. It's a little bit difficult. You really have to think about it. So y equals 1 over x. What can't I do with x here? What would my domain be? Well, the domain here would be any real number except for 0. So why is that the case? I'm just going to put x does not equal 0 here, just to say all real numbers except for 0. The reason that x can't be 0 is because we can't divide by 0. So anytime you see a function and you have x in a denominator, you know that your domain is going to exclude 0 because division by 0 is undefined. So this is one of the things we look for. So the domain cannot be 0. Now it can be anything else that you want because there's no restriction on dividing by a negative number, positive number, fraction, whatever. Okay, You can divide by all that stuff, you just can't divide by 0. Now the range is much more difficult. You really have to think about the extreme scenarios here. Now we know that we can plug anything in for x except for 0. Now what happens if I plug in just a regular number here? 1 over 5, that's just 1 fifth. 1 over 10, that's 1 tenth. Well if I think about, let's say I plug in a huge number for x, like 1 million. So 1 over 1 million. That's going to be a really, really small number, but it's not going to be 0. In fact, I can increase this number here as much as I want. I can keep adding zeros no matter how many zeros I add there, no matter how big the number I plug in for x there. The result here, y, will keep getting smaller and smaller, and it will keep approaching 0, but it will never touch 0. Okay, it's something we're going to study later on called an asymptote. For right now, we just think of, I plug the biggest number that I can think of in for x, and I'm going to get a really small number, but not 0. Okay, so that's a little suspicious. I don't think the range is going to include 0. So let me think about it from the other scenario. What if I plug a really small number in for x, the smallest number that I can think of? Let's say like 0.0000005. Something like that. Well, if I plug that in, y is going to get really, really big. It's going to blow up, right? In fact, the, the smaller the number in my denominator, the bigger my result, right? You know, if you divide, let's say 1 divided by like 0.25 would give you 4. When you divide by a smaller number, like in this case, you're always going to end up with a bigger number. So we know that the extreme scenarios here are covered. If I divide by something really, really big, I'm going to approach 0, but I'm never going to get to it. 
If I divide by something really, really small, my y value is going to blow up. It's going to just go way, way up, way increase in value. So my range here is going to be the set of all real numbers except for 0. And again, this is a tough one to kind of figure out. Really, for something like this, I would recommend that you graph it. And I have a graph provided down here. Let's take a look at it. So you can kind of see that, again, as the x values increase, so we go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, you look at the value of the function. It's decreasing, right, because we're dividing by these bigger numbers. And so it's, again, approaching 0, but that graph could stretch out for the rest of time. It's never going to touch 0. We'll get really, really close, but it'll never touch 0. So you can see as we get between x values of 0 and 1, the y values go up dramatically, right? And that keeps going up to infinity, right? Because again, when you're dividing by these numbers that are less than 1, between 0 and 1, as you get closer to 0, your result gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you look right here, this would be a y value of 0, right? This right here. You can see that right here, it's never going to touch zero, and right here, it's never going to touch zero. It's going to get really close, but it's never going to touch that. So hopefully, by looking at this graph here, you can see that the domain does not include zero, and the range does not include zero as well. So again, the domain and the range for this function, y equals 1 over x, would be the set of all real numbers except for zero.